I see all these people flipping out about these cartoon apes. And I'm like, what? What are these apes? Like, what is going on? One of the best things that NFTs have brought to the table is they have made the collecting so accessible to people. All my early collectors are OGs in my mind. But for me, art is like a need. It's not a want. And collecting is just another form of that. I clicked really fast on the people drop and I actually managed to get it for $1. If I've collected your work, I'm holding it with diamond hands. If you're collecting something, it could be come hot in two minutes or 200 years. Welcome to the Collector's Call with Particle, where we chat about art with the top collectors and creators in Web3. I'm your host, Scooter, and today our guest is Shane Lavalette, a photographer whose works have been exhibited at the High Museum of Art, the Centre for Documentary Studies at Duke University, the Aperture Foundation, and many other institutions. Shane is the co-founder of Assembly, a Houston-based gallery and agency that supports visual artists, as well as Assembly Curated, a fine art photography NFT platform and community. If you enjoy this podcast, be sure to subscribe and leave us a review. Without further ado, here's my conversation with Shane. Shane, welcome to The Collector's Call. Hey, Scooter. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Well, I'll give us a bit of a roadmap maybe to get started. I'm hoping to to dive in with a couple questions about your your own background, then talk, of course, about your your art and, and the various things that you've got going on within, within artistic creations and, and everything related to that. And wrap up with some questions on collecting as well, which I know you've got some unique perspectives on. Does that sound okay to you? That sounds great. Awesome. Well, let's dive in. Earlier this year on X, people were posting images of the art versus the artist, and you shared a childhood image with a Polaroid camera in your hands. Could you tell us a bit about your background and how you first became interested in photography? Wow, very perceptive. Actually, yeah, I think in some ways around that age, when I was maybe like four or five years old, something like that, I had, you know, these babysitters that would care for me. I was living with a you know, single and and she was very busy with a lot of things and our neighbors would care for me sometimes. And they, I think, gave me my first camera, which was a, a Polaroid camera. And actually, I think it was like a Ninja Turtles camera, like a sort of disposable kind of Ninja Turtles camera. And around that age, I, you know, started making pictures. And of course, with Polaroid, you can kind of delight at, you know, discovering the images immediately, this, this kind of magic of images revealing but, you know, it wasn't until maybe high school that I circled back to photography and I think probably for the first time saw it as an artistic medium. I, you know, went to a public high school, but the school I was at actually had a, a black and white dark room. So I think similar to that, like early magic of experiencing a Polaroid peering in front of your eyes as a child. I encountered that in the black and white dark room and working with film and learning how to develop and um, learning how to print using an enlarger and just kind of seeing this relationship between, you know, looking more deeply at the world and then, you know, creating something that might sort of transcend what we, you know, otherwise might experience as photographs as just having these more general utilities as, you know, family pictures or descriptive documents. And, you know, suddenly images could be kind of deeper and more complex artistic experiences. So yeah, I definitely attribute my early interest in images to those neighbors that took great care of me and introduced me to cameras. And then I think that trajectory just kind of continued from there. Like I went to Boston, the School of Museum of Fine Arts, Boston and Tufts University and studied photography. And while I was a student, you know, in the early days, I, I was really interested in photography books. And so that was also kind of like an introduction to a lot of work that was happening by artists. And that was how I discovered a lot of sort of seminal artists that probably influenced me, like a lot of early color photography, for example. But I was also from maybe like 2003 through, I don't know, eight or nine, I got involved in an online community during this explosion of blogging. And what was interesting about that was it was I mean, in some ways, there's sort of a parallel with the, the NFT community is kind of like this digital world and community came together and you were cross pollinating and, you know, meeting people in this kind of accelerated way. And then you were learning. So like for me, it was my kind of early days of writing about photography, interviewing artists and like in a, I guess, sort of informal way, curating. And so after college, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm just doing the chronology here. 
but you know, after I got out of school, I was really lucky and had this opportunity to work on a commission with the High Museum of Art in Atlanta. So as a young photographer, you know, of course, my my mind was blown that I was kind of in such great company with all of these artists that I admired, like, you know, Sa- Sally Mann, Emmett Gowan, Richard Mizrak, Alex Soth, Dawood Bay, Mark Steinmetz, this like kind of list goes on and on, on my lay. And I was given the opportunity to create a body of work over the course of about a year, a year and a half to be exhibited at the museum. And that really propelled my trajectory as an artist and helped shape my, I guess, particular way of working and thinking about the world and and my relationship to photography. And then that experience led me to doing a residency at a, a nonprofit organization that's called Lightwork, which is based in Syracuse, New York. And Lightwork does a lot of things, but the residency program is one of them. And so I spent a month there scanning all the film from that project and, you know, perfecting the files to be printed and prepared for this museum exhibition. And it was this accelerated experience of having access to a space and having support to kind of move through that process, which was also just very exciting and unique to me at the time, Uh, still kind of, you know, very early in my career. And it just so happened that someone was leaving a position as the associate director at the time. So I applied for a job, you know, I I was already doing some independent curating, and I was working with artists to publish books. And so I had this interest in kind of champion, championing and supporting the work of other artists that I admire. And, you know, by some fortune, I got the job. And so I moved there in 2011 and started working, helping run the organization. So overseeing, you know, grants, fundraising, strategic planning, all of the exhibitions, programs, the publishing, Uh, you kind of do a lot of things at a nonprofit. And a few years later, the director left, so I became the director. And, you know, fast forward 10 years, in 2021, I departed from that role. But I, you know, spent almost a decade working with at least 100 other artists who came to the residency program, probably curated 50 exhibitions, worked on at least 50 books and other kind of art projects that are residual. So it was incredible, incredible experience and just kind of continued to propel me in that direction. And over the course of those years, still making time for my work. You know, I've, I published a few other books myself. I worked on a commission for the Swiss Foundation for Photography and Musée de Lycée and exhibited work over there. I did a residency uh, or as a visiting artist at the American Academy in Rome and developed a project there, which actually became my first NFT project here in the, the Web3 space. But then, you know, the pandemic hit and It was around that time that I was already thinking about a change in terms of my role with this organization and and just kind of this belief that, especially for nonprofits, it's really great to have kind of new leadership and changes in vision, and it just kind of helps propel organizations forward. And so a good friend and colleague of mine, I think we had probably been to, you know, Paris Photo or APAD or, you know, some of the like art or photography fairs around the world together and planted a seed with each other, but we both had this shared vision of finding a new model for supporting artists in the commercial space. And we were both sort of ready to part our roles at our institutions. And so we put our heads together and it was this, you know, a scary time to do so, I think like early on in the pandemic, but it was also this moment of, I guess I would say reimagining and that that feeling fit very well with this vision we had for Assembly, which we founded then as a kind of hybrid model for supporting artists, a bit like a gallery, a bit like an agency and sort of this, you know, fluid creative studio, essentially, where we could help artists, you know, write grant applications to find funding for their work, or we could, you know, edit and sequence books to pitch to publishers, or we could, you know, we would do all the things that a traditional gallery would do, like place works with collectors and museums and institutions, or an agency we would work with you know, brands or magazines and work on creative storytelling projects or help artists license their work. And that's really what led us into the Web3 space. I was maybe in 2017 that I personally got interested in Ethereum and was kind of like following, you know, crypto and sort of getting a better understanding of what smart contracts might do. But, you know, it was a little later to the party to see in 2020 and 2021, the real potential for NFTs and especially for 
you know, visual artists. And I, I definitely had a recognition then. And, and so did Ashlyn as we were building out assembly that, you know, when it comes to creating and when it comes to collecting, we're just going to continue to do that more and more in the digital space. It's, it's definitely not going to become less a part of our lives. So how can we, you know, help artists navigate the space? How can we help collectors navigate the space? How can we, you know, facilitate best practices for artists? And then, you know, in, I think the summer of 2022, we opened a physical gallery space in Houston, Texas. And Houston is an amazing, amazing art scene with, you know, top-notch institutions. So it's right in the museum district. It's in a building with five other contemporary art galleries. It's close to the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, CAM, the Manila Collection. So we have this art audience that comes through our space and is, of course, interested in a lot of things that we show that are are physical and are purely about the physical experience. But we've done exhibitions like a collaboration with Art Blocks, for example, that encourages the conversation about generative art and thinking of photography as a digitally native medium. But really with the space now, we're, we're trying to kind of bridge those worlds and, you know, help what we might call digital curious physical art collectors to explore that space. And then vice versa, I think through operating assembly as the first curated fine art photography platform since early 2021, we've, you know, met and connected with a lot of amazing, amazing thoughtful collectors who might be newer to art or newer to photography. And then now they're like, oh my gosh, I want to, you know, in addition to this joy of collecting digitally, I want to, you know, fill my house with great physical work as well and have an expansive collection. So uh, yeah, as it sounds, I, I wear a lot of different hats, but I, you know, continue my work as an artist. And then I, through assembly now, just continue to get this great experience and rewarding experience of working with other artists whose work I really like and appreciate and can help champion them. What a wonderful introduction. Thanks for walking us through your your background. And as you've mentioned, it sounds like like you, you wear a lot of hats and, and you've had some trials by fire in, in being pushed into, into the deep end here in, in terms of learning about photography and, and uh, curation yeah. and, and it, really it all, really the, all like aspects of the art and creative <laughs> world. <laughs> exactly. The, the earliest phase of, of your, your artistic uh, exploration. Thank you once again for sharing that. You've yeah. described your photography as lyrical documentary. What does that mean and what kind of works do you enjoy making? That's a great question. I mean, in many ways, I think of photography as being kind of akin to something like poetry, like there's sort of a, a language to image making. And I've always been interested, you know, just like poets string words together to kind of create interesting meanings. I've always been interested in how images live with each other, like how photographs change each other. When you experience a great exhibition, you're you know, as you move through a space, your your experience of a photograph that you encounter is kind of altered by, say, the one that you saw before it or its scale in relation to other pieces or photography books, which I really love. You know, they have kind of a beginning and an end. They have maybe a narrative. Sometimes you have images paired on pages or, I mean, you literally see a photograph and then you turn the page and it's kind of like, you know, in your mind while you're experiencing the next photograph. So these are all kinds of the, the things that I've been interested in about the medium of photography, in addition to, you know, just approaching image making in a way that maybe emphasizes slowing down and, and looking a little bit deeper at the world and kind of finding something that can be profound in, you know, a, a moment that otherwise might seem pretty simple unless you stop to notice it. So, you know, I guess that's what I what I mean or what I think of when I think of lyrical photographic work. There's sort of more room for interpretation. There's a bit of poetry involved and in how the images are coming together. And and yeah, that's that's absolutely with, with my project One Sun, One Shadow, for example, that, you know, became my first book and was that project that I started with the High Museum. It's a project about music and it's documentary in a sense, because it's about a particular place and time. But, you know, it's lyrical in that it's, it's, it's much more interpretive. It's not like a, you know, I didn't travel around the American South and, you know, purely make photographs of blues musicians, for example, I was much more interested in how place kind of, well, I would say the relationship between music and place, how like the landscape of the American South brought about 
the sounds of blues or old time or gospel and vice versa, how kind of the, you know, stories that come in songs are almost like an oral history have a relationship to our understanding of place. So the photographs are and at times, you know, just about the musicality of everyday life, you know, it might be landscape, it might be portraiture, it might be still life, and like kind of these minor genres of photography. But within them, there's these sort of like musical elements or musical feelings. And then in some cases, maybe even musical subjects like you know, I, I spent time in places like Clarksdale, Mississippi, or Memphis, Tennessee, or like places that kind of have musical significance, or I went to particular locations or sought out subjects that have significance historically, but was often kind of drawn to, you know, the light or the things that were sort of peripheral to those subjects. So in some ways, I think that maybe emphasizes the, the lyrical quality. Thanks for giving us a bit of background into into that that concept of of lyrical documentary. It was it was new to me, and I've been doing some reading about it since hearing you mention it. And it it sounds like an interesting dimension of of photography. So it's wonderful to see you explore it. Uh, as you mentioned, your series of works, One Sun One Shadow, it captures some of this concept that began as a commission by the High Museum in Atlanta for the exhibition Picturing the South. Could you tell us about the focus of that exhibition and and a bit more about how your works fit within it? Yeah, it's I mean it's an amazing program. I, you know, wish more institutions had opportunities like that. I mean, many many museums do commission artists, but it's kind of this like an intentional program that's about, you know, the museum being positioned in Atlanta and, you know, being one of the leading museums in the American South and, you know, having a relationship to its community, its location. And they started the program, actually, I mean, originally with artists who were from the American South. So working with some well-known artists who also have, you know, a deep connection to place. And then over time, they also thought, you know, wow, this is going to be important to kind of expand the kinds of artists we're working with and bring in artists who are from other places and kind of, you know, see this place and see this landscape and, you know, observe us or kind of find their own connections to the sense of place in the American South. And I think that's, you know, in part how I was brought in. As I mentioned, I was, you know, really young. I was early in my career. I think I was 23 when they commissioned me. So it was, you know, kind of a, a life or trajectory altering moment to have a bit of support. And the way that the commission works, which is also really great is they provide you, you know, some funding up front. And then as you complete the work, you deliver the photographs to the museum and it would go into the permanent collection. So I think in the end, 24 photographs of mine went into the High Museum's collection. And, you know, if they were to purchase those photographs at their retail price through the gallery I work with, it would probably cost a lot more than, you know, what I was paid to do the commission. But the commission enabled the creation of the work. And for me at the time, it was it was significant to be able to take, you know, it it was really as much as almost two years, actually, because I spent a whole, whole summer living out of my car and traveling all over the American South, enabled by this experience. You know, I stayed on people's couches or I would camp at state parks and, you know, three months of doing that in the, the summer heat <laughs> everywhere from, you know, Florida and the Carolinas to Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia. Was really kind of all over the place, Tennessee. And then, you know, having the luxury to kind of, well, I was working with film, so I, I wasn't actually seeing the photographs that I was making while I was traveling, but I would get back in that case after the like two and a half or three months of travel, process all the film, and then go through the slow process of, you know, scanning each photograph and kind of spending time with the images and returning to some, you know, m might have at the time that I made them not have felt like the photographs that were really special. But then later when I would look back, they kind of had a different experience to me. But yeah, it was it's sort of how the program works in general. And then they've since gone on to continue commissioning other artists. Like more recently, I think it was Mark Steinmetz. They did, I think Martin Parr was one of the commissioned artists. And it's just, I hope they'll continue to do it. But I think the the format of institutions being able to provide some upfront funding for artists to create and just kind of like create without as much limitations. And then, you know, the result might be an exhibition or the works go into the collection is, I think, a really, a really special model. 
it, it sounds like a perfect example of a of a stereotypical win win where where you get something out of it and then they manage to obtain works in their permanent collection that they couldn't otherwise. Some of those works as well are, are featured in a current exhibition, A Long Arc, Photography in the American South, which is exciting to see that this trajectory is continuing. I have a, a bit of an aside. You mentioned some of your travels through the South in the course of, of creating these works. Do you have any favorite songs or, or musicians that really appeal to you from that region? That's a good question. I listen to so, so much stuff. I mean, everything from like just early blues, like I don't know, duck bogs and like all these field recordings that I was digging up. I did the like folkways collection is really, really amazing. If you, if anyone looks into that, you know, I'm, I'm not a religious person, but I found myself just digging up gospel music just because so much of gospel music has these like really deep and rich themes that are about you know, death, life, this kind of like intensity that I think like blues music also has, of course. But I felt this sort of relationship between a lot of the themes and stories and feelings that come out of the genres of music that are sort of birthed from the American South and, you know, just the the landscape itself. So like the the Southern landscape, especially for someone who grows up in like me in the Northeast and kind of spent most of my life in the Northeast, there's sort of like a kind of darkness about the landscape in the American South or this duality. And of course, it's like tinged with, you know, a complex history of slavery. And, you know, the the nature itself kind of has a bit more kind of danger in it, like, you know, snakes or alligators or, you know, these like big spiders I would wake up camping next to in my tent, whatever it might be, there was this duality that I was interested about the, the beauty of this place and also sort of like the, the darkness and complexity in the American South too. There's certainly quite a bit of poetry in the, in the photographs from this collection that you've captured. And it's, it's really interesting to, to peruse them and, and think about that musical and lyrical element in the background. Thanks, Turning to, oh, you're, you're most welcome. Thank you for creating it. Turning to your uh, collection that you've mentioned as well, New Monuments. I believe that was your first series of, uh, of NFTs. It's based on 40 photographs that explore themes of conservation and human desire. What interested you in those subjects and how did you explore them through this collection? Yeah, so I, I was a visiting artist at the American Academy in Rome. And I, you know, I wasn't in Rome for too long. It was maybe, if I remember correctly, it was like three weeks. It was a little less than a month. And, you know, I think Rome was kind of the perfect place to explore these subjects because it's such a, a rich place for architecture and history and art. And it was, I mean, it was certainly an inspiring place for me to be. But I was, you know, sort of going through a moment personally where I was thinking a lot about our desire to preserve things, like both in a sort of literal sense, the way that we try to hold on to pieces of art or we use conservation techniques and we, we almost have this like false perception that it's going to preserve things like everything's sort of degrading but also on a like on a personal level just how we kind of hold on to other people or I don't know our bodies as we age or you know memories that we don't want to forget or you know or we do want to forget whatever it might be and I wanted to kind of draw this parallel between these photographic studies of things like you know, literal preservation and conservation techniques of, you know, I don't know, frescoes or pieces of art or sculpture, studies of architecture on the street, documents of sculpture and art that's within, you know, some of the collections that I was visiting. These, the photograph that you just pinned, for example, I spent some time in an archive that had all of these photographic slides, which was, of course, interesting for me to think about. And drawing a parallel between this more conceptual idea of how we're holding on to things in other ways on a personal level. And to do that, I just, you know, I, I made a lot of street photographs, essentially, like I was just looking at people and kind of trying to find these in between moments, these kind of moments of maybe inner thought or contemplation, these maybe strange oddities or collapsing of, you know, moments of everyday life that almost felt like sculptural or that felt monumental in a way. And, you know, a lot of my other photographic work is, I guess, more described, that has more underpinning and a sense of, you know, place or kind of a narrative. And my, my books, for example, they have a little bit of text that accompany them. This book was much 
the intention of it was to be more interpretive, even more so. It's probably the most conceptual project that I've done. So there's no text. It's just only photographs in the book. And I think that kind of that's how you might enter this space as a viewer and, and leaves even more room maybe for interpretation of the work. But actually, you know, to, to kind really of tie it to the blockchain and, and think about why I was thinking about it as NFTs, you know, obviously the the subject of, of preservation and permanence is a part of it. And that to me was like an interesting component when I got interested in the technology. It was like, okay, there's this, you know, ability to create, you know, authenticity, ownership, provenance, all of these new possibilities that are sort of made easier and leveraged by this technology. And there's similarly sort of this promise of, of preservation, of conservation, of, of permanence, and, and thinking about some of the technology that enables us to archive or maybe utilize this network to preserve things better than just having it be on a internet server, for example. So for me, it felt like a, at least there was like sort of a conceptual link between the work that I was introducing and kind of starting with and thinking about within the NFT space. I really enjoy this this collection. I like the idea of exploring the concept of a monument through modern works and images because it's a term that we mostly associate with with statues and and some you know ruined physical elements some of which you've also captured through your work. I really like the juxtaposition you you pair in your monograph photos of a roman sculpture next to a cat on a sidewalk and then you have as as pictured here some more formal art handling gloves used to to interact with images that have a bit more of a modern flair like like polaroids and, and slides. I think that's that's something mm. that, really elicits a, a bit of a, a new idea and a different feeling that I wasn't expecting to experience. Is that is is that something that you enjoy as well, looking at the world through through the lens of, of what will have some lasting and enduring qualities into the future and how we should be reframing some of our perspective of what we enjoy around us? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, it's interesting you mentioned that because I was thinking about this when making the work as well as just like how we how we choose to make things in the world significant you know why why are some objects more significant than others and and why do some objects maybe develop a you know an aura about them like they i mean obviously history and the story can can play a role in why certain objects or works of art are kind of mythologized for example but i was sort of trying to look at the world and look at these studies and objects or discoveries that i would find on the street and look at them sort of through that perspective, like, can this be monumental? Can this be significant? Could this, like, moment in passing be something that we just look more deeply at? It's it's a wonderful series of works. I encourage everyone to take a tour through. I think they're easily searchable here on X Twitter. And yeah, it's inspiring to to reconceptualize what a, a monument is. And it's a great match with the blockchain as well. It forces a bit of additional interrogation into the concept of provenance and, and permanence mm -hmm. and authenticity, as you've mentioned. It was interesting, actually, because the, the early days of kind of minting this work and, it, you know, it has me thinking about like platforms and certainly that's influenced a lot of what I've done with assembly and helping other artists. But because, you know, as we talked about earlier, like because I'm really interested in the relationship between images, like that's propelled me into working in exhibition form or working in books. When I thought about how my work might live within the world of NFTs, that was also a really, really important element. So you know, in those early days, I was minting the work on foundation, but there's there's a sequence involved in how the photographs come together. And I think there were even maybe collectors that gravitated to particular pairings of works or groups of work where they kind of saw the significance or the interesting connections between photographs. But at the time, the possibilities were kind of limited for how you might be able to kind of showcase your work. I mean, a lot of the platforms you know, rightly so sort of serve as marketplaces, but they're kind of like, you know, marketplace forward, like the experience is kind of like financial at the forefront or like transactional. And so I was really looking for ways to emphasize the work itself and, and the relationship between images and be really image forward. And so at the time, you know, I sort of did the best I could with the kind of tools that I had available, but that definitely led me down the path of thinking about what 
what might be some important considerations to help make sure that that's possible for artists. That's very interesting. And it certainly sounds like it informs some of the work that you've done with uh, Assembly Curated around providing tools to individuals for them to showcase their works in the way that they'd like to, because that that really isn't the foundation of of much of the initial platforms available to us within the Web3 environment. I think we'll we'll touch on that in just a moment here. I'm curious to ask about a one of one that you have everything that touches us, which is on, on Super Rare. And it has quite the story behind it. Could you tell us what was involved in creating that piece? Yeah, actually, that kind of started out of a, a, a magazine project that I worked on that was about this community. I, I grew up in Vermont and in my home state, kind of near where I grew up. There's this amazing farm and there's this nonprofit organization called New Farms for New Americans. And it essentially it helps like immigrants who've come to that area learn about agriculture, have access to land, maybe grow crops that were native to their home country, but also learn a lot of like practical skills for, you know, finding labor and working within this new community that they're joining. And it's this incredible, incredible organization that's full of amazing people that I've gotten to know through working on that project. And it just became really important to me. It became close to my heart. And, you know, I I worked on this story and then it kind of expanded into a broader edit of photographs that felt like they were, you know, somehow more significant and meaningful to me. You know, it's just an, an experience that I can relate to in part through my partner or other friends that I'm close with. It's, it's certainly not my personal experience, but this is a beautiful place. It's like a, it's a beautiful gesture. It's a beautiful organization. So I wanted to do something special to support it. And, you know, I'm, I've been thinking actually about minting more work that might be a part of this series because I have so much more, but there was this one image that I knew was going to be the starting image. And for me, it was an opportunity to, you know, simultaneously support my practice and, and draw some interest into a photograph that I made that people could hopefully spend time with in, you know, a deeper way, but also simultaneously raise funds and awareness for this great organization that people might want to support. So the the auction of the work on Super Rare was to, you know, support the the nonprofit organization. And actually since then, sadly, the there was a flood that happened in Vermont, like a really bad flood this last summer. And all of the crops were like pretty much destroyed. So I think even more so this organization needs some support. And so that's why I'm thinking about kind of doing more in this vein or as part of that collection on Super Rare at some point. And, you know, if there's any collectors that are listening or, or someone who might be interested in supporting that, I'd be happy to share more of the work and, and kind of talk about some interesting ways that we could do something to expand that too. Oh, that's that's wonderful to hear. When you released this work, you wrote that you felt this piece represents what you love most about photography, how it connects us to the world and to each other. What is it about photography as an art form that helps to connect people? It's a nice question. I mean, for me, it's it's almost, I mean, it's it's a teacher, like photography is a teacher that, I mean, as I mentioned, it kind of forces me to look more closely at the world. It, it brings me sometimes into locations or places that I might not otherwise go. Certainly I've met people or had conversations with people that I might not have met and then, you know, become close to those people or connected to them in important ways. So for me, it's, it's, it's kind of all of these things. It's, it's a teacher and it's sort of a passport to going places or meeting with people that you might not otherwise. Oh, thanks for that thoughtful response, Shane. Let's turn a bit to uh, to curation and, and assembly, the fine art photography NFT sure. platform and community that you've helped to create. What was your goal in in creating this platform and what are you hoping to explore through it? Yeah, well, you know, I think in early 2021, there there wasn't really a place to go to for for art photography. There wasn't any sort of clear kind of curatorial platform. There weren't I mean, quite literally, there weren't curators working in the space. So me and Ashlyn, I think we kind of put our heads together and thought, wow, we can, I think, bring some real value here to help introduce artists in a way that kind of provides deeper context for their work, presents it in a way that artists and photographers really want their work presented. You know, speaking of 
like permanence and and blockchain you know it's kind of like when it's when it's out there it's out there so it's it's almost like publishing a photography book or something like that where there's going to be you know a thousand copies or two thousand copies out in the world you really want to know that it's exactly how you want it to be before you hit print so to speak so you know i think in those early days we recognized there was a value in creating you know a discord community to bring people together to you know kind of create this cross pollination you know i mentioned that i worked in the the nonprofit world for about 10 years and at least the organization that i worked with was kind of like a physical version of that it was like this you know community lab space that brought people together and they would share work with each other they would ask questions and help each other with figuring things out and i think in many ways our early discord community was that it was just like you know where do i go if i'm interested in art photography and you know you could go to assembly and then similarly the platform i think that was like the vision you know could we make a space where you know it might be a mix of emerging and mid-career and established artists but every single artist and every single project that's on the platform is going to be compelling it's going to be an artist who's deserving of support it's going to be you know works of art that you can kind of sink your teeth into and there's there's depth to so really being able to kind of drive these conversations about you know artistic and cultural value of work in relationship to you know what might be financial value in some cases but provide a space for artists to feel as though their work is kind of being handled with that level of care that might be similar to how you know a gallery or a museum or institution would treat the display of work you have a lot of experience with curation from before assembly was founded how does curation in web3 differ from traditional curation and what kinds of opportunities or or challenges do do web3 curators face Ooh, that's a tough one. I like that question. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think the like I, again, I think I come back to the fact that like the the tech there's sort of like limitations to the technical aspects or display of work. But what's interesting is that led us early on to also explore like virtual spaces and thinking about other ways to experience digital work in the digital space. Uh, you know, I think some of which were you know clunky or you know maybe less interesting and some of which were like really novel or like kind of you know don't necessarily replicate how you experience a physical gallery space in the world but you know give you some other way to like you know fly through images or you know move through them in a way that you don't expect but you know i think that we we actually kind of did our best to think about drawing parallels between the process like the same way that you go through you know editing and sequencing a book or you know laying out an exhibition within a physical space to try to understand the best we can you know how to bring together a collection of work with artists that's going to be experienced or felt like an exhibition and it might be a really simple but you know if you if you go to the assembly curated site you know i'm not sure of others that have it actually but it's it's even though the site is still very much like the the beta stripped down simple version of what we're envisioning as we go forward you can visit a collection page you can click on an image and you can sort of move into a slideshow view so it allows you to kind of more immersively view with the images and move through them with the intended sequence from the artist so these like really simple gestures i think are are really important Assembly offers a, a wonderful platform for uh, photography to be experienced. You've got, I know, a physical presence, but then also a, a digital one. So kudos to to you and and your collaborators for for creating this. It's it's something that I think we hear often in this space is sorely needed. Additional supports for curation, and you're certainly leading the way in terms of photography. Thank you. Yeah, I think we. I mean I'm an artist myself of course but it, you know when we began I think it was started with this recognition that you know when you're when you're working as an artist you're very rarely just kind of doing one thing like you you are actually wearing many hats you're you might be selling prints you might be doing lectures you might be you know publishing books you might be applying for grants you might be gosh I don't know the list goes on like managing your social media whatever it is right So, you know, we wanted to be able to be supportive to artists across all the modes of what positioned us to do so. 
Well, it's, it's working wonderfully and it's great to hear you, you speak about it. I'd love to turn to a few questions on collecting for our time remaining. In a recent interview with Aperture, you said that authenticity, ownership and provenance will make digital collecting continue to flourish. Can you expand on what makes you optimistic about digital art and the NFT space? Yeah, I mean, and I think that, you know, digital art's been around for a long time. It's been collected for a long time. But NFT technology has just kind of introduced, I guess, an easier mode of kind of collapsing these things on each other, where the authenticity, the ownership, the provenance are sort of combined with the art. So if you're a museum or institution, you want to, you know, acquire a piece of video art, for example, you know, in the past, it might have been on a a CD or, you know, a USB thumb drive and then come with like paper certificate of authenticity or, you know, sort of has this kind of like a clunkiness to how institutions think about collecting digital work. Maybe it's a, literally just a file that's, you know, sent on WeTransfer or something. But I think that it presents this opportunity to collapse those things on each other and make them easier for, you know, collections like that, both both at the institutional level, but also for individuals. And then, you know, photography, I think I've spoken about this before, but photography has kind of always been intrinsically linked to technology. I mean, it's like sort of born out of, I mean, it is a technology, essentially. And so over the years, we've had evolutions like, gosh, I don't know, the digital photography itself. And within like the art photography world, there was like a rejection of that being being art or being photography. And then, you know, however many years later, an acceptance or the explosion of Photoshop and kind of the altering of images and a rejection of that being photography. And then however many years later, an acceptance and, you know, AI as well. I mean, I think that the the term photography is, is hard to define, but like very certainly photographic and, you know, AI is being used as a tool for photographic work and there's similarly kind of like a, a fear or rejection. And then, you know, however long it takes, there'll be an acceptance that these are all just kind of tools to lend towards the photographic. But I, you know, I do recognize that like there's just no way, like we are, are live digital, you know, for, for better or worse. I mean, I think there's some people that um, are going to love that. And there's some people that, you know, reject that or, you know, don't align with that experience. But, you know, no doubt, Digital creating and digital collecting is going to become more and more a part of our lives, especially as the means to do so becomes more frictionless. Like I think we're in talking about NFT technology, for example, it's such early days that it's, you know, it can feel clunky. It can feel challenging for people who are new to it to navigate the right ways to do things, to, you know, practice proper security when it comes to like storing assets you know, just like the user experience of it is still so new and developing. But I think it's a little bit like the early days of the internet, really, right? Like, you know, you don't sort of say like, oh, I'm going to go like, connect to the, you know, hypertext protocol, like you just sort of like use the internet. (laughs) And I think that in some ways, like the word NFT, or like the technology that we're kind of talking about, or feels like it's at the forefront of the experience is slowly going to become, you know, not like it doesn't exist, but like, you know, there's just digital creating and collecting and there's physical creating and collecting. And it's kind of as simple as that. And I think that, you know, blockchain technology emerged at a time where a lot of these solutions were needed and it kind of continues to be one of the best tools for providing those. So, you know, unless something drastically better emerges to replace it, I think it will just continue to progress to it improve and be more easily adopted and utilized in interesting ways. Thanks for that response, Shane. I appreciate and enjoy hearing photographers talk about technology and the adoption in relation to the art medium, because I think there's a lot more experience there than with other mediums that are now migrating to the blockchain and, and good good shared wisdom from uh, from some rejection and concerns around adopting new practices that probably is most relevant to, to AI and some of our conversations around it today. Yeah, I, I mean, I think people are that always like ask. have some sort oh. of fear about the unknown, I guess I'll put it that way. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, I have a little bit of a delay here. So my apologies for the interruption there. No worries. I'm 
eager to hear a little bit about your own art collection and, and what you like to collect. I think uh, Atan has has commended your your punk that he spotted here in this space. What kinds of art speaks to you, and, and what do you enjoy collecting? Oh yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, I've having been in the space, I was fortunate enough to be able to meet some great people and, of course, sell some of my work and kind of trade my way to being a part of some great communities that are here. But beyond, you know, photography, which obviously I love and I collect and, you know, I live with like my walls are mostly full of photography, like photographic prints and my walls are lined with photography books. Like I've been a a book collector for a long time. But within the world of NFTs, I mean, I think some other things that have really interested in me include generative art. Like I think that, you know, photography is obviously a digitally native medium for most creators at this point. But what's interesting about generative art is, you know, it has a history that goes back to, say, the 60s or 70s, and then, you know, exploded with early computer art. But artists have been working with code and algorithms for a long time. But with the emergence of blockchain, there's been kind of new possibilities created for what is often called long form generative art. So, you know, artists who are working with code and algorithms and creating these interesting artistic projects that have parameters to them and introduces kind of for the first time the ability for a collector to kind of be a part of the creation of the work. And, you know, that could have a you know financial element to it, but it could also literally be, you know, a free mint. But as a like artistic and creative gesture, it's such a kind of fascinating and interesting thing. So I've really enjoyed learning more about the process of coding and the process of creating those works and then exploring some of the artists who I think are doing some of the more innovative things with that technology and, you know, making work that, you know, not just kind of uses it and, you know, like looks cool, but actually making work. There's like a few artists who I really, really admire who are making work that is also extremely meaningful and and kind of moving to sit with and spend time with as well. Is there a work in your collection that has a a unique story behind it or holds a special significance for you? Gosh, putting me on the spot. Well, I might I might go to I certainly have some digital works that do that, but I might go to a physical piece that I have at home. It's it's a piece by actually an artist named Alison Rossiter. And it's a really, really simple frame photograph. She works with tracking down old photographic paper, like paper boxes, some of which are from, I don't know, the 50s, 60s, and they haven't been used to expose to light, but just because of their age and how they're stored or maybe even the like residual light over time that's kind of gotten into the box, there's kind of like a light leak quality. And then she does various kind of interventions with those paper works. So she, you know, takes them and, you know, dips them and developer and then processes them and sometimes creates these geometric forms. And sometimes she creates these images that almost look like a landscape, but it's literally just like, you know, developer and process. But I think like she, as an artist, there's something that I've always really appreciated about the simplicity of her work and the kind of the beauty and noticing this I don't know, almost collapse of time that happens. I think there's a lot of works that are really moving to me that where time is kind of an element of the work itself. But when you see an experience for her physical prints in person, I think they they sort of do something really special, like kind of speaking back to the what we talked about, about works kind of having an aura. I feel like her pieces have an aura. And, you know, I worked with her on a project that was a really great experience together. And, you know, we, I think we, we had traded work or we did something like that, but it's, it's one of the more special pieces in my collection. I pass it most days and, you know, as kind of simple as it is, I try to, when I can stop and admire it for a second. Thank you for sharing the story behind that uh, piece. That leads into the the last question I have here, which is you, you've released a number of monographs and of, of your photography. You also create NFTs, of course. What kind of relationship do you foresee between physical and digital collecting over the years ahead? You know, I think it will continue to just be you know more fluid. Like I think artists who have art 
research practices already work in ways that are multifaceted. They think about exhibitions, they think about books, they think about their work when it's on, you know, posters and postcards, they, you know, think about how their work lives on social media, they think about their websites, they think about NFTs. I think the like process of creating is going to be different for every artist and, you know, working digitally might not be appealing to some artists and, you know, working physically might not be appealing to some artists. And I think the same is true for collecting. I mean, I think that there's this, you know, sometimes I talk to people within the art world that maybe don't understand NFTs or don't understand the desire to collect anything digital. Like they just, you know, haven't done it or like the, the idea of it isn't appealing to them. But, you know, I think as soon as you as soon as you get why that's the case, as soon as you kind of like make that leap over and enjoy the, you know, efficiency of supporting another artist or the like beauty of engaging with a digital art piece and being able to, you know, add that to your collection in digital form, it's like everything kind of changes. So I think there's this whole world that does get it and and that world is expanding and will and will continue to grow and expand and, and i think that we'll just see more fluidity there as well like i think within you know some of those folks that i was alluding to who i talked to who might be kind of skeptical or maybe not get it there's kind of this feeling from them that like oh you know nfts or oh this like kind of digital revolution is emerging and it's like a replacement to physical art or something like that when in reality it's it's, you know, it's, it's the opposite. I mean, it's not like, like you, you can't replace a physical art experience. So it's not the same. There's not ever going to be that replacement. There's this expansion of how artists are working. And there's this complement to, you know, how you can enjoy collecting and engaging with art. You know, the same kind of thing happens within, I don't know, the world of music or something just to kind of provide an analogy. You you know, if if you want the experience of, a, you know, the sound of vinyl and, you know, hearing it on your record player, you know, the liner, then you get the vinyl, but want the experience of enjoying the music efficiently or having like a digital relationship, then you, you know, probably stream it or find some way to digitally support and experience it in that way. Um and, you know, there's interesting things happening in the world of Web3 to kind of change some of the possibilities for music and and, and having musicians find other ways or besides like the, you know, sort of Spotify streaming models and things like that, which for a lot of artists can feel very broken or like it, it doesn't really work to reward them as well. But it's just, you know, a helpful analogy that they're not like this antithesis of each other that are, you know, tugging at each other. In fact, it's this just expansive world of new possibilities and developing possibilities. Many new possibilities, and it's exciting to, to participate in and observe that evolution. Shane, you've been very generous with your time. Is there anything else you would like to share with us about art, collecting, or any other subject? Oh, gosh. I, I mean, I guess I would just say that if, if anyone wants to be in touch, if anyone's either in the crowd hanging out right now or is, you know, listening to this recording after the fact that I'm I'm very accessible and I always like to connect with people and, and have conversations about art or hear what other people are working on. Um, so like definitely reach out and, you know, there is the assembly discord. It's, it's a, you know, it's a bit quieter than it was in 2021. It's kind of like a cafe that you can pop into. I encourage anyone to, to join and check out assembly curated on Twitter. If you're interested in art photography, I think it still has some of the, the best artists who have introduced their work into the NFT space and it's going to continue to grow and be like a great resource. So whether you're acquiring work or you're just kind of interested in exploring and, and being inspired, it's it's definitely a space to do that. But yeah, I appreciate being on. It's been a great conversation. I I feel like you brought so many thoughtful questions and and thank you for, you know, spending proper time with my work as well prior and just having me here. It's it's been really nice. Well, thank you so much for being here, Shane. Your photography tells a multitude of stories and, and the work you do with Assembly really enriches the Web3 experience for both artists and collectors. Thanks for joining us today to share your story. Thank you. I hope everyone has a good day. Thanks for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed this podcast, be sure to subscribe and leave us a review. And don't forget to join us at our next collector's call.